Tante, kisha super nan in tika ton. A miskuchi was kahikan utinia, a pidegosisan nia. So I'm Dr. Keisha Supernant, and I just introduced myself in one of my ancestral languages, which is Cree. And uh, I said I'm from Edmonton, Miskuchi Waskahigan, uh, and I am Métis. And by that I mean a member of the Métis Nation uh, of Alberta, and have very deep family roots in, uh, in Alberta as well. So I am here, I'm very happy to be here on the traditional and unceded territories of the Anishinaabe and uh, here in the Ottawa Valley, which is an important uh, gathering place for Indigenous peoples, um, and also in the nation's capital, which has its own uh, histories as well. And I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, when good archaeology, as we might think of it, goes bad, and what that means and what the history of that has meant for the Indigenous peoples, primarily of Canada, and I'll use examples today from the Canadian context, but it applies in a lot of colonial situations where the relationships between indigenous peoples and settlers is uneven. So um, I want to begin though when, when Sean, uh, thank you so much for having me as part of this lecture series and I'm very happy to, to be one of the amazing speakers that you have. He said he wanted to do uh, a series on bad archaeology. And I thought that was a very interesting concept, thinking about what that meant. But it also made me think about who gets to decide what is bad and what is good. So how does that judgment get made? How uh, does that play out in a disciplinary context? And so I kind of want to start there. So let's start with the question, what is bad archaeology? And you're hearing examples of that throughout this lecture series. Uh, and I think there's some things that we can kind of collectively agree upon are bad, right? So looting of archaeological sites is bad. Selling the, the materials of archaeology, bad. Uh, destroying the archaeological record without due process, bad. Uh, aliens, definitely bad, right? <laughs> And then we have some things that I think we support as, we uphold as good. So something that is based on data and evidence using the scientific method tends to get held up as good archaeology. You're doing that process, you're establishing excavation units, you're carefully excavating, you're conserving the materials, so conservation of those materials is good. I put on here as well uh, something that has been increasingly discussed in archaeology, which is talking with descendant communities, uh, whether they be indigenous communities in colonial contexts, whether they be uh, descendant communities in other places in the world, is starting to become thought of as good archaeology, although 15 or 20 years ago there was definitely a question mark there. Who gets to decide these categories? How do these things get determined? So who decides what is bad and what is good? Well, we have legislation in Canada, for example. Provincially, heritage resources are managed through law, and so they require us to do certain things. So to do something illegal is therefore bad, and something legal is therefore better, right? Good, that's debatable. We have codes of ethics. Professional organizations establish codes of ethics for how we do archaeology, what kind of standards that we, we have for archaeological practice. So these professional organizations have a role in defining what makes archaeology good and what makes archaeology bad. And so that's important to think about as well. So I, I'm a professor, I teach a lot. I train my students about what archaeology is and how to do it. And part of that training is what is good archaeology and what is bad archaeology. So I have a certain degree of power as an instructor in a classroom to determine what that is, to define the boundaries of bad and good. Then we have the process, of course, of peer review. Uh, for those of us who do research, we take our articles and we write them into you know, journals or books, and then our peers get to determine whether or not those materials are worthy of publication and in what ways. So that also defines what is bad and what is good. So if it's publishable, then, well, somebody thinks it's good, right? And if it's not publishable, then something is, is not good with it. So these, these things are, are defined in particular ways. And then the last one I have on here is the process of bidding for contracts. We know that in the Canadian context, the majority of archaeology happens in cultural resource management, heritage management, where archaeologists go in and they have to do an assessment before development happens. So in that context, what defines good archaeology is determined in part by the winning contract. So the, the boundaries of what that looks like. So that context has different sorts of structures which determine what is good and what is bad. 
So I think it's really important to understand how these things get defined before we can unpack what happens when we think we're doing good archaeology, but maybe we're not. So there's a lot of text on here, and, and, and uh, I don't know if everyone can read it all, but I wanted to point out two things that are inherent um, in the codes of ethics of our major organizations. So this is from the codes of ethics for the Society for American Archaeology. It's the largest organization in North America um, that is a professional association of archaeologists. And their first principle is stewardship. So archaeologists are the stewards of the past for the good of all, which is the primary message here, that it is our job to advocate for the archaeological record. We are the caretakers of the archaeological record. And it is our job to communicate to the public the importance of that history. So just park that one for a minute. Let's think about some of those terms. This is the Canadian Archaeological Association Codes of Ethics, their stewardship uh, section as well. The wording is a little bit different, um, but it basically is that archaeologists will exercise respect for the archaeological remains, and that stewardship, again, involves having care for and promoting the conservation of the archaeological record because it is unique, finite, and fragile. So these codes of ethics define how we uh, are to approach archaeology um, and what good archaeology looks like. So a good archaeologist is a steward of the past. A good archaeologist is someone who takes care of that past uh, and communicates it for the good of all. So let's look at some fundamental premises that emerge from some of these framings of what is good archaeology. One of the fundamental premises that is embedded in these codes of ethics is that archaeologists have the right to study human history for the good of all. This is something we teach in classes, that archaeologists are the people who help to bring all this information out, to share it with the world for the good of everyone. And often we frame it as the right way to understand the past. And often when, when we teach, and this is certainly something I did, uh, especially earlier in my career, we talk about how because we base our interpretations on evidence and on data and on sound method that our interpretations are good and something like ancient aliens is bad. So we often hold those things up against one another but the reason that ours are good is because of science, data, evidence. Right? So that's what makes them good uh, in a lot of cases and experience, right? Being able to look at the full suite of information that you have in front of you. And then you know, clearly in these codes of ethics, we have this idea that archaeologists are the rightful stewards, that it's sort of our job to be a caretaker. So what I really want to talk about today is what gives us those, it, this idea that we are the caretakers of the past, and when that's maybe bad archaeology, right? When is our role as caretaker not an appropriate role for us to have? I sit in front of kind of a funny place, and I'm going to use our in probably a couple of different ways here, partly because of the discomfort of being an Indigenous scholar in the academy. Because often it's the academic or researcher, the archaeologist, and the Indigenous person. And embodying those two things together sometimes means I'll use our to talk about archaeologists, and I'll use our to talk about my Indigenous relations and community. So when I, I will tack back and forth between those. But I actually have started asking my students this question which is what gives us the right to study pasts that are not our own, right? It's one thing if you are working in, an in a context where it's clearly your own history, but if you're coming into a settler colonial context and you're studying other people's history, what gives you that right to do so? And I think we can clearly see the ties of this to settler colonialism, to the histories of how colonization happened. Um, so I, I think about uh, the ways in which the history of places get told. Since Europeans came into these lands currently known as Canada, uh, and the history of, of that, they've been starting to tell the history of these, these lands in their own ways, um, from settler perspectives, using frameworks that are closely tied to that. So what do, I, what do I mean by this? What do I mean by archaeology as sort of settler colonialism? Because I think a lot of people who teach archaeology acknowledge the colonial roots of archaeology, but I argue that we remain a deeply settler colonial structure as it is, so it's not just something to talk about in the past, it's something to think about in the present 
of what we are as a discipline. And that can sometimes mean that we think we're doing good archaeology, but maybe we're not. So let's talk terminology for a minute here. So starting with uh, colonialism, and I want to make a distinction here between colonialism and settler colonialism. So settler colo colonialism is the process of establishing, controlling, and inhabiting a colony. The idea is that colonialism has an endpoint at which that is no longer a colony. That place is no longer a colony, and then becomes post-colonial, which is a term you might hear in theoretical context. Settler colonialism is a place that was a colony and where settlers displaced and often through processes of, of genocide removed a lot of the indigenous inhabitants and remain there and have established systems of law based on where their ancestors originally came from. So in Canada, British law, for example, or, or influences in, in French as well. So this is the idea that the structure of the society that exists in what was a colony remains tied to that original colony. And this means those structures are ongoing, right? So this process is ongoing. Two ideas that are closely tied to settler colonialism, uh, especially in, um, in the Americas and in places like Australia and New Zealand. One is patriarchy and heteropatriarchy in particular. So the assumption that within these structures of law, the default person is white and male. Uh, and straight and cis. And that matters because it matters in who is then deviant from that uh, and who is sort of centered in that. And these are, you know, these are important concepts to try to understand because they influence our day-to-day -day lives and they influence people differently. They have different impacts on, on people. And so another thing that we've been seeing a lot more discussed in our contemporary political moments, uh, especially with our neighbors to the south, uh, is the question of white supremacy. And you really see, even on our own campuses, I just saw on Twitter a couple of days ago that there were um, some white supremacist posters that went up at the University of Victoria. Right, Not a place you'd necessarily think. We had them at the University of Alberta. Right, It's okay to be white. And this whole idea that uh, whiteness is somehow under attack right now, um, and this is one of the foundations of settler colonialism, which is the assumption that white societies, peoples, and knowledge systems are inherently superior, are the right way to do things. And I want us to think about what that means in the context of archaeology, <clears throat> right? In terms of how we make decisions about what is good archaeology. One of the ways to look at this is who does archaeology? Now I love showing this slide. This is a Google search. I encourage you all to do this. It is, of course, location specific because Google changes the results depending on where you are. But I would type in archaeology professor, and this is what I got. So bearded white men, primarily. Uh, several Indiana Jones are sprinkled throughout here, which is kind of one of those things. Uh, and now we can talk about, I could do a whole talk on whether or not Indiana Jones does good archaeology. He does not. <laughs> <laughs> he may punch Nazis, but that doesn't mean he's a good archaeologist. Um, so you see from here that there are uh, a lot of men still as a default place. It doesn't mean that there aren't women doing archaeology, but this is the image that if I, when I tell people I'm a professor, they're like, you're a professor? You don't fit my image of what a professor should be. And this remains sort of inherent in some of the work that, that we do. Of course, this is a Google search, so it's not necessarily a meaningful data set. But I think it's important to look at who does archaeology in different contexts because it helps us understand the ways in which uh, settler colonialism can play into our uh, interpretations. So let's look at some data, some science, well, statistics, are they science? I'm not sure. We look at some stats. The Society for American Archaeology surveys its membership on a regular basis, and then they make the uh, information available to their membership. And so I went on and I pulled the data around uh, what, one of the questions is, what is your ethnicity? And for better or for worse, that's one of the questions. And they have a bunch of options. And so this is the breakdown from the last you know, 15 years of their surveys. So in 2003, 90.1% uh, of respondents said that they were Caucasian, I think was a term that they used, but white. Uh, and then in 2010, it was 83.7. And in 2015, it was 77.7, with the biggest increase in their, their category of Hispanic, um, which I might use Latinx at this point. <coughs> 
You'll note I highlighted a few others. Um, so Native American hovers around 1% of the membership of the Society of American Archaeology, which has, I think, 8,000 members. Like, it's a, not a small pool. Um, and African American is even more shockingly low, considering in the US the proportion of uh, Americans that are uh, African American. And why does this matter? Well, they also asked a question in 2003, where do you work? In what area do you do research? And as you might think in a North American uh, archaeological organization, the majority of people work in North America, in Mesoamerica, and in South America. What do those three places have in common? If we take this into account, these are histories of these places that are likely yeah, and we, there are settler colonial situations, but these are likely indigenous histories. Yes, we have some historical archaeology where people work on uh, the history of, of sort of colonies, forts, that sort of thing. But the majority of this research happens on indigenous lands and indigenous histories. So the majority of people who are telling archaeological stories about the past in North and South and, and Mesoamerica are not indigenous people. And for a long time, uh, indigenous voices weren't very prominent in the discipline. So why does it matter, right? Well, it matters because archaeologists are still seen as experts on the past. We're the ones who get called up to like comment on some find somewhere. Um, we're the ones who you know get to argue about the the data that uh, support certain hypotheses and interpretations about the past. But even more so, and in, and in some ways, uh, this is really also important. Archaeological knowledge gets mobilized in different ways against indigenous people. And we see this perhaps most clearly in court settings. Right? I, I have a colleague of mine um, who did his dissertation research working with uh, a Simshian community on the northwest coast. And he wrote his dissertation, it came out in the late 90s. And in about 2010, 2011, he found out that the Crown had been using his dissertation research to argue against the community with whom he'd been collaborating for 20 years to try to uh, argue that they did not have any kind of economic-based fishery um, prior to European contact. So he thought he was doing good archaeology, but then that became part of the court uh, argument against, and they lost, the Laquilams lost that case, in part because of that uh, dissertation work that he had done. So we can see this in a very literal way, um, and it is, for me, it's perhaps most clearly that way within the, the systems in British Columbia where the land claims are unsettled, where they don't have treaty. Archaeology can be on both sides of that argument. So it's important that if, if archaeology is being used to disenfranchise indigenous people, that we think about why that is and why that's possible. So I wanted to look at a few examples um, about how this has played out and how this has somewhat shifted over the course of our discipline. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about a story that I, when I did my dissertation, where I thought I was going to be able to do really good archaeology, and it turned out that I couldn't and didn't. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the archaeology I do now and how that differs from what I did before and why also that matters. So let's just step back for a moment. If you've taken an archaeology class, and even in some cases if you ha haven't, you've heard a lot of sort of stories of, well, if you were at the last talk, you've heard pseudo-archaeological stories, right? This idea that um, throughout the world there is a lack of an understanding of the capacity of ancient peoples, and most of those ancient peoples um, are not... Uh, are not white. So a lot of that idea of these people could not have possibly built the pyramids. There was just an article this week about the pyramids. and They finally figured out the mystery of how the pyramids were built. It's like, that, that's not how that worked. No, we, we know how they were built. Um, some really classic examples, Great Zimbabwe in Africa. So early col colonial archaeologists coming in and being like, well, the people who live here now could not possibly be descended from the people who built these amazing cities. Right? Th this idea that there was this inherent bias in the interpretation, and therefore they tried to find explanations. The myth of the mound builders in the eastern United States, right? classic example, couldn't possibly be Native Americans, must have been the lost tribes of Israel. Uh, and I, another thing I saw on Twitter, um, so I don't know how many of you know, but Megan Fox is doing a, uh, a show for the Travel Channel, and it's all about kind of 
the untold mysteries of the planet through archaeology. She actually took an anthropology degree, and I'm sort of horrified that she's now doing this. But the upcoming, there's an upcoming episode that's all about the lost race of North America. Right? These narratives exist and persist, but they have their foundation in early archaeology. Right? And that's important um, because also archaeologists, as the discipline continued and as they became more aware of, of that, science and evidence and data were used to show that these places were of indigenous origin. Let's move to a more recent example, the one I always like to teach about is bad archaeology. <laughs> so this is the ancient one, also known as the Kennewick Man. Um, and I'll give you the brief overview. Some of you may be familiar with this case, some less so. So in, in the mid-90s, there was a set of um, ancestral remains found near Kennewick, Washington. Uh, they were taken to the coroner, who happened to also be an archaeologist. This is Jim Chatters here uh, holding um, the skull that is behind the image because we don't show ancestor ancestors. And he did some basic analysis, noticed there was a, a, a stone point embedded in the hip, sent it off for radiocarbon dating, comes back about 9,000 years old, and then he does his write-up in sort of coroner speak, calls it having Caucasian-like features. And then this was born. So he did a facial reconstruction, and it does look shockingly like Patrick Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> but this has caused so many issues. Right? And this is a qualified archaeologist doing a facial reconstruction. It's in a gray clay, which doesn't help. But the whole question of Caucasian got picked up as, this is a white guy. Right? And why is he here uh, 9,000 years ago? And it, has, it still remains in the narrative of, of white supremacists who want to argue that there was a race of Europeans in North America that were wiped out by Native American and, and, and indigenous peoples. So this narrative has played into that. There was a lengthy court battle because under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act in the US, the, the tribes from the area were allowed to say, if you have ancestral remains, we get to have them back, right? That was the agreement. They, they tried to get them back. A group of archeologists basically stood up and said, this will be a, too big of a loss to science. You can't let them have it back. And it bounced back and forth in the courts until the mid 2000s. Uh, after which it went through the Court of Appeal. Um, the, the confederated, the tribes that were involved decided not to pursue it any further, uh, and uh, the ancestor stayed in the Burke Museum. That was until 2015. Uh, in the meantime, one of the, the people who had been deeply involved in the court case, Doug Owsley, who's at the Smithsonian, uh, did a whole bunch of analysis, wrote a 600-page non-peer-reviewed book about it, and then, because we've seen a real rise in the role of ancient genetics and DNA, one of the major uh, ancient DNA labs in the world, run by Eske Villerslev in Denmark, in Copenhagen, um, did, uh, went to the groups and said, would you allow us to test your ancestors' DNA to see what might happen? And when they did the test, the, one, of the, one of the actual tribe's samples was very closely related to the ancient one. So, based on this, he got to go home. Which, okay, is a, this is good archaeology, right? This is a good outcome. Archaeology was used in this way. But it still took science to prove what the indigenous communities of that area already knew and had been arguing for 20 years. That's what caused him to go home. He's now home, he's reburied. But it took science. So this still plays out in interesting ways. Right? And this history, this legacy is very much present in, in, in how we think about our discipline and how we uh, sort of conceptualize um, a lot of it. And I think it's really important to, to query why that is, right? Why is it that science remains this powerful part of how we tell the history of, of places, right? And I've been thinking a lot, we talk about white supremacy and that's really problematic. But I also see patterns in parts of the discipline, what we call the trap of sort of scientific supremacy. Right? So that science becomes th the best way. There may be other ways, but they're not as true as science. And this, of course, impacts indigenous communities' ability to tell this, their own stories, because the way indigenous peoples understand the world doesn't fit easily into the modes of Western science, although there's some shared 
practices around observation, interpretation, and things like that. But the frameworks of how many indigenous communities talk about their history is very different, right? And so this idea that, you know, I, I love me some Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I, I can't agree entirely with this because it assumes that there is a truth to be known. And when we're talking about the past, which is always interpretive, right? We never have the truth of the past. We're always making interpretations in archeology. span So I wanna just briefly talk about a couple of other recent examples that I think help to illustrate how history gets told and in what ways and by whom. So what was the biggest Canadian archeological story out of the past, let's say five years, would you say? Anyone wanna tell me? The Franklin Expedition, <laughs> right? So first, uh, in Parks Canada archeology span was a very important part of Parks Canada. 85% of archeologists from Parks Canada are fired. And then, less than a year later, we found Franklin, a huge news story. Harper himself was there for the unveiling, right? I could, again, get a whole, give a whole lecture on this, I won't. Um, <laughs> what I will say is there's two things. One, this is where all the resources went. And yes, I understand there's a question of sovereignty, but this is not about indigenous sovereignty, this is about Canadian sovereignty in the Arctic. I get that. Two, it was never lost. The Inuit knew where this was. They've been telling archeologists for, well, they've been telling people for a hundred and some odd years that they knew, you know, <laughs> the terror found in Terror Bay. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> and also, why are we so interested in a bunch of white guys who didn't listen to indigenous people and then ate each other and died? <laughs> There's so many other stories to tell, right? So, yes, the archeology span done here was very cool, right? I like the sciencey part of archeology. span I will fully admit that right now. But why this story? And then the other one I wanted to mention briefly so some people may be familiar, some may not. Um, Sarah Parkak won a TED Prize for doing what she calls space archeology, span basically using satellite data to find archeological sites. And as part of that, the only thing that they focused on in Canada, Vikings, more white guys from Europe, right? So she spent, they, they thought they might've found something, they did not find something in Point, Point Rose, but there was this you know, documentary made and all these news stories and all the sort of emphasis. These are the narratives that get picked up, right? So this is still going on. Um, and we can see this in sort of the media narratives and then we might push back against some of those because the media always translates things in particular ways. But I was also thinking about terminology. Here's some terms that you can see a lot often um, and these are the things that again get picked up. So mysterious, let's just never use that word in terms of archeology span again, please, no more mysteries. I also am not a fan of discovery. And the reason I'm not a fan of discovery is because it assumes like you found this thing that was unknown when in many cases there's been a long history of those lands that are told by other people. And so an archeologist discovering something um, may not be the right term that we want to use. It kind of erases that connection. Same with lost, right? the lost this or the lost city of that. To be fair, that's what originally, uh, when I was a teenager, I just thought lost cities were the coolest thing, right? Part of what drew me into the discipline, but that's not how I want us to narrate that past. These last two, I think are also really interesting in terms of how archeologists frame our own work. Uh, often we want to discover that first earliest um, of something. It gets us the most media attention. It gets us the big publication. This is particularly acute in the peopling of these lands, right, where people first came from. So we want to find the earliest example of X, right? And there is a real emphasis on that. Um, and that can be really problematic because there are many indigenous communities who strongly uh, push against the narratives and the way they're framed around being, we're all immigrants, right? So they, people walked over the Bering Strait and came into these lands. Here's just a few examples of some recent uh, titles. There was this uninhabited Amazon, right? People thinking the, uh, the Amazon was somehow empty. Archeologists said, we think there might've been mil a million people here. It's like, well, that's a large area. That makes a lot of sense. 
why did we think it was uninhabited? Um, this case, so this was the, some work done on ancestors from the Chaco Canyon region. And the article that this is the title from reads like something written in 19, the 1960s. It's like these, these scientists go into these, pull out these drawers and look at these bones. And their argument, they didn't have any community involvement here. They didn't talk to any descendant communities. And they said, well, but we don't know actually who was descended from the people at Chaco Canyon. So that was their excuse uh, to be able to run analyses on, on this. And then the other example was the Ata infant in the Chilean desert. It was actually a much more recent infant, but it used to be used as an alien. Um, and when this was all being discussed, I mean, this is someone's child who, who uh, was left out in the, in the desert, and it's like, the image is everywhere. And it's all about, they, they, they look like an alien, but actually had a genetic deformity. And so it's a really tragic story. Um, but it also was, the analysis was done without permission because good archeologists were trying to disprove the alien theories. They weren't thinking about the nuance of what that meant for other communities as well. Now, highlighting some examples of archaeology I'm not much of a fan of, you know, and I can sit and point the finger all I want, but I want to talk a little bit more personally because I think even when we're trying to do good archaeology, sometimes it doesn't go as we planned. Uh, and it's important to, one, talk about those failures, but it's also that failure has allowed me to reflect much more deeply on this issue than I would have been uh, otherwise. We know archaeology is shifting, right? We have seen uh, a movement toward an increasing involvement of descendant communities, specifically indigenous communities in North America, in Canada, right? That there's an involvement in, of these communities in the archaeological project anywhere from consultation to sort of community di driven, I've put my like good and then better, uh, happy faces. So this idea that there's a continuum of, of involvement of indigenous peoples um, and a lot of the work that I, I've been talking and thinking through right now is community driven work. So where the questions are defined by an indigenous community um, and then those are uh, brought into archeology. span and this move, I think most people um, who have been educated certainly in the last 20 years or so uh, would agree is a, is a good move, right? This is moving toward a, a good place. This is not universally understood. Um, there was an article in 2008, for example, um, by uh, Bob McGee, Dr. Bob McGee, um, and he was very much against, you know, keep these things separate. Science is science, indigenous peoples are indigenous, and you know, we, we can't bring that in because it would undermine the science. This argument still exists, but it is getting quieter, I'd say. So we have an understanding that this is, you know, the way that we should be moving. This is a way that would be good. But what happens when you want to do this and you run up against things which don't allow you to? So when you have good intentions, but the result is actually bad archeology. span so I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna use my own personal example here um, because I know it intimately and, I, and um, I'm very cognizant of the places where I made mistakes, fair, but also some of the structural issues that were uh, brought out in this whole process. So I did my PhD at the University of British Columbia uh, in unceded Musqueam uh, territory. And I came into my PhD wanting to do collaborative archeology. span So sort of the style of the time, it was the mid, 2000s, the mid-aughts, and I was like, I'm going to go and I'm going to work with community. I want to bring that narrative into my dissertation. I want to think about landscape from an indigenous perspective. Um, and so I went in to work with two First Nations uh, on the Fraser River in British Columbia. And this area uh, ha was home to some really interesting archaeology. So these are uh, terraces and walls that are built out of stone, so they're dry masonry stone. And we only find them in a stretch of the Fraser River, about 150 kilometers inland from Vancouver. And it's also a very, very significant site for First Nations people now and in the past, because it's the best possible fishing site on the entire river. You can catch salmon really easily, uh, and you can wind dry salmon because there's a consistent dry wind in the summer. So you've got a giant run of salmon in a constricted canyon. You can pull them out super quick, process them, preserve them. Wind dried salmon last twice as long as smoked salmon, so highly desirable place. Uh, home to a, a permanent population in the past, also home to an amalgamation during the summer months of possibly 10,000 people between July and September. Huge conglomeration of people. 
And then here are these rock walls. So I was really fascinated by this. Uh, there was interest from both communities for me to do this work, but the communities did not get along with one another at all. They were actually in the middle of a very, very contentious treaty negotiation where one of the groups, the Yale First Nation, was going through the contemporary treaty process, and the other, which was Shuhamal First Nation, part of this Stalo Nation uh, kind of umbrella, was a conscientious objector. They didn't believe that process, they didn't want to settle title. And what this meant is that this area in particular was really hot for that dispute, because this was the core of that important territory. It's showing its significance today, as well as that significance in the past. So I went in um, to talk to the communities, and I sat down with the folks at Yale, and I brought in a map. I actually brought in uh, this map here. And we're talking about some of the things, the ways I could map the sites, because I wanted to do, to do mapping. And it had this term on the top, haslas. Haslas is a Halkamalam word meaning hurt or injured person, which I thought was very evocative, because this is a very fortress-like place. But I brought that into the Yale First Nation and they were like, that's not our name for that place. We, uh, we, you know, you can't put that on there. And I was like, okay, right? So that's not their narrative. And it was um, a very, very clear response from them. The other reason this area was really important, this site in particular, the site is, a, is an Indian reserve. Throughout this whole region, there are a number of Indian reserves all of them but this one belonged to the Yale First Nation, and this one belonged to Shuhamal. And so Yale was trying to argue in claims court that this should be their reserve, right? Because all the other ones in the area were. And they had just received a letter from the claims court that sort of po was positively saying, yes, this is likely your should be yours. And so they started putting up no trespassing signs right around this location. This is location here. Um, and that created all sorts of other trouble, right? So property of Yale First Nation, no trespassing. When I was gonna go out and map this site, because I, again, I sort of had both of them saying, yeah, you can still do the work, it's okay. Um, what had happened that very day I was supposed to go out there is there was another project that was expanding a hydro line that was gonna go through this site, uh, and ancestral remains were found. And of course, representatives from both communities were there, the RCMP was there, and I was not there but I heard things got really ugly. Next morning they returned to try to address the remains and they were gone. So this was all happening in and around what I was trying to do, but I was trying to work across this, right? I was like, well, how can I find a way to, to do all of this? How can I find a way to incorporate these different things? And I fell back on the scientific narrative. I fell back on that sort of archeology span as objective science. I did a bunch of statistics and I ran spatial analyses and I kind of did a lot of that type of work. I didn't really want to do that work. These are just some, some quotes about the dispute um, that came out of the newspaper. Uh, and so a lot of them talked about, you know, the courts will settle things, right? So again, legal systems that are not inherent to the land and to the people are the things being used to determine uh, who has rights and who doesn't. So this is the debates around these different spaces. Um, of course, you know, historically we do know there are relations between these two groups, but they were very adamant that they weren't related, right, that we were a separate, Yale says we're separate. And why? Because they wanted to get treaty in part, right? So it was designed by this sort of top-down structure. This was the area of overlap, and I showed these two, these are two maps of sort of traditional territory. So one from the Stalo, uh, broader um, umbrella, and it includes the red circle there is the, the lower Fraser Canyon where I worked, and this same red circle, this is Yale's treaty map, right? And so the, those are very clearly these overlapping claims. Uh, in 2010, as I was writing my dissertation, this debate was ongoing, and I just love this quote, it's like that, uh, this will be tested in the courts and fought out on the rock walls of the Fraser Canyon. And because it was about fishing rights, right, which is so essential to First Nations in, in BC on the coast, like fishing is such a core uh, part of who they are and, and how they understand the land. And this de debate kind of raged on for a long time. It did get settled, Yale signed treaty, treaty was ratified, and relations have improved significantly as I understand it. But it was an extremely difficult process uh, to try to navigate through. And like I said, I defaulted to archaeology. 
because I didn't see any other way through. And perhaps there was no other way through. But why did I have to do that? Well, because there was this divisive process going on. It also made me think a lot about academic knowledge and how that gets generated. So one of the, one of the challenges was that Stalo um, and the groups that, that made up the Stalo Nation, Stalo Tribal Council, had had a long history of archaeological research, anthropological research, oral history research. They had 45 years of academics working with them, and Yale did not. And so Stalo was using a lot of that information that had been generated to try to you know, make their argument. And Yale didn't have any of that to kind of counter with. And so it actually created kind of a power imbalance between these two communities, because one had this history of research and the other did not. And I was trying to figure out my way through that. When I went to present my work to Schwahamal, I got called yet another in a line of, of colonists coming in and, and colonizing their lands. And trust me, as an indigenous woman there, it was a very difficult thing to hear, but they were wrong because I was using a colonial framework primarily because I didn't know what else to do. What were my takeaways? Well, the land claims process is divisive. It's a divide and conquer strategy, right? And it often can create these imbalances and these dynamics. So when communities get set against one another, then the kind of the crown or, or sort of settler society can step back and say, well, look, they're dysfunctional. It's not our fault, right? Uh, the territory claimed had ramifications. It had economic ramifications. It had spiritual and cultural ramifications. Like this mattered so deeply to these communities as well. And archaeological knowledge is often evoked in these claims, right? So there have been other cases where communities have wanted archaeologists to help them prove uh, their territories, which is actually difficult to do with archaeology because we can't always distinguish between close neighbors based on their stuff, right? So when it became, okay, well, if I'm collaborating and I want to be able to involve people in, in the process, who do I listen to and what are the consequences if I do create a relationship with a certain community? What are the consequences for, for other communities, right? What does that mean? So in 2010, I got my job at the University of Alberta and I moved to my ancestral homelands. It's where my people are, are from on my dad's side. Uh, we were disconnected through child welfare and that was an amazing opportunity for me to completely shift the way that I did archaeology. And I started working on my own history. Um, I'm going to skip briefly the next slide, just to, on the interest of time. So, I started thinking about what it would mean to do a Métis archaeology. And one of the first things I had to understand was who are the Métis and why does that matter? And so I started off kind of learning from my family, who I did a lot of reconnecting with. I learned from other Métis scholars uh, and learned about the perception that uh, a lot of Canadians have, which is if you have an Indigenous ancestor, you're, you know, Métis, a recent one, or sometimes a not so recent one. That's again a whole other talk. Uh, so I started thinking about what would this mean for an archaeology, right? Uh, most archaeology that had been done on the Métis focused on this question of mixedness and hybridity. So the ways in which we were framed as a people has been very deeply rooted in a racialized understanding of us. And Chris Anderson talks about this at length in his 2014 book. My father's birth certificate says half-breed on it. Right? Even though we are Métis, took Métis script, all these types of things. So this idea of this, this racialized uh, identity and this sort of mixedness did a lot of, um, had a lot of impact on how people thought about what little had been done in terms of a Métis archaeology and the Métis homeland. And so I started thinking about what this meant. And how might we do an archaeology that doesn't center mixedness as a defining trait of the Métis? Because I'm still interested in how we emerged as a people in Western Canada, what that looks like in the archaeological record. And I had first come at it in terms of that framing, like that it somehow should be a mixture of First Nations and European, as opposed to being Métis, which is actually a different way of thinking. And this really matters in Canada right now. We have seen a huge increase in the number of people self-identifying as Métis <coughs> on the Canadian census. And the biggest areas of growth are in Ontario and east of Ontario. And the Métis homeland is in Western Canada. So things to take away here is that we are a people and a nation 
And how do I look at this archaeologically? How do I look at that personhood and the nationhood from an archaeological perspective? Because uh, that racial definition is an external one, right? It's one that was imposed upon us as opposed to how we understood ourselves. We raised a flag in 1816 and said we're the new nation, right? Our, our ancestors did that. And that's important for us to understand in terms of how we think about the archaeology. Because 1816, that gives us a place in which people already had a sense of a nation at that time. And this can lead to claims of, of Métis rights by people who are not Métis. And this is a real problem. And it undermines our own ability to determine who we are. So previous archaeological research on the Métis, as I started to get into this, had really looked at kind of this question of, of Creole. Creolization was a term that was often used. Uh, an emphasis on European objects and the ways in which, especially, uh, there's a couple of papers around how Métis women tried to be more like their kind of Victorian and British uh, cousins and that kind of thing, or French cousins. Um, so there's this emphasis on this mixedness. There was very little done, right? So there's some work done in the 1970s, a little bit done in the 1980s, and, a, and a one project in the late 90s. But for the most part, this is a really underexplored area of our history from an archaeological perspective. When you do see Métis archaeology, it tends to be in the context of like fur trade forts. So however the Métis living in the fur trade. I want to look at our own places and our own spaces. Hence the birth of Amida, which is my main, one of my main projects right now. So this is the Exploring Métis Identity Through Archaeology project. I've been running since 2012. Um, I work with my family. I work with Métis organizations in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, I designed research that was going to contribute to our, uh, our own community, having a positive impact, uh, in particular thinking about rights, right, and Métis rights, and how we can show where we were on the land in the past. It's also researching my own history. And as someone who was uh, removed from my, my own history because of colonization, it's an act of reclamation for me. It's an act of resistance to that, right? So it's important for me to learn who I am and uh, to be able to teach my daughter in a different way who she is in a way that I never got to learn. And I do that because I work with my family. Those relations are essential to that process. So the archaeology helps, but without the relations, the archaeology can only take you so far. So I've been using a framework, as opposed to this hybridity idea, I've been using one of our own frameworks. This is the Métis sash, right? very commonly evoked symbol in a contemporary setting of the Métis. The other one is the infinity symbol, which I have in my earrings today. So I've been thinking about how I can use this framework as a way to understand Métis archaeology. And I've broken it down into kind of five strands, which I then weave together into the sash. Right? Uh, I draw some of this work from uh, colleagues such as Brenda McDougall, who's at the University of Ottawa, uh, and some of her writing with Nicole Senange as well, where they identified what they saw as three key components of Métis identity during this, during this sort of 19th century especially, and how that informs Métis uh, people today. Mobility, and geography, uh, and what they call kinship or kinscapes. I've added on economy. Uh, in part because it's easier to see archaeologically in some ways, and in part because it was also important. There were different ways in which Métis structured their economies which matter in terms of how they thought of their, their lives. And then the element of Métis daily life. Because that's what archaeology can be really good at, right? That, those, those intimacies of daily life. The things that don't enter into the written part of history. And so for me that's a really important thread. So uh, very briefly, in the, the time I have left, I want to run through uh, a little bit of how I think about each of these um, and how they are informing what I do now and how, for me, this is the archaeology that I want to be doing. So first is the Métis cultural landscape. So again, recognizing that the core of it sort of spreads between Red River, Fort Edmonton, uh, and has a, has a broader reach but has some key nodes. Uh, in that and travel through this landscape being a very important part of that. So how Métis uh, were grounded in some of these key settlements, but we also moved all the time, right? This is a very important part. So I've been looking at mobility and geography through the concept of trails, and this is not, a, not the easiest map to, to look at, but these are all historical trails. So working with some colleagues uh, in the HGIS lab, History GIS at University of Saskatchewan, they have some trails data, and then we did some, we created some trails data in a geographic information system. 
and I did uh, some mapping. So this is a, what's known as a least cost path analysis, which is basically a way where you can ask how do people move from point A to point B based on landscape features, right? So slope uh, is one, aspect can be another, the presence of water can be another, uh, the, um, the type of travel can be another. In red and blue are my models, and in black are Métis trails, or trails being used by Métis and probably many others as well. But these were, were known uh, trails of the Red River Cart, which is a classic uh, Métis transportation. And what this was able to show me is that in some cases, this captures it relatively well. There's some areas of overlap, and some that it really doesn't capture very well. Uh, and this is also trails that would only be in use. I don't know how many of you have been to Alberta, but you can't use a cart trail for about seven months of the year, at least, maybe eight, because they're covered in snow and frozen and all that. So dog sled would have been a much more common form of travel in the winter. This does not account for dog sled. Totally different way of traveling on the landscape. So the point of this was that we are highly mobile, but the models that we create in archaeology don't capture that mobility well. So how can we shift that to create a different framework to understand that? Another thing that I looked at um, was demographic data from historical archives. This is actually from Métis script. So this was a program in the uh, 1885 to about 1900 where Métis people could identify as Métis, sign script, get either a land grant or $250. <coughs> Very problematic system, disenfranchised most of our, our ancestors, including my own. But we, can, we have a lot of great demographic information from these. Um, and my colleague at the University of Alberta, Frank Tuff, has done a lot of digitizing of these. And so this looks at surname density, where people were born in the script records. And you again see that Métis landscape. There are nodes. Red River's a big node. Fort Edmonton and Lac, Lac La Biche, which then would have been Lesser Slave Lake. One of my ancestors is in that, that record. Uh, but you also see the spread around that whole landscape. Because family and kinship were a key component of understanding who we were, uh, particularly kinship among women. So a lot of sisters uh, kind of held together a lot of the Métis um, kinship networks. And we can actually see at archaeological sites uh, clustering of cabins where Métis people would have lived and into groups of three or four, right? And which I interpret as families. Right? So you're building next to your sister or to your auntie or to your cousin. And so you live close with your close family members in the wintertime. These are winter, uh, wintering sites, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. So we can actually map those connections onto different clusters of, of cabins. So family, kinship plays an important role. Uh, we also often have demographic information from some of these sites because most of the people here were Catholic. Catholic priests would come through, they'd marry people, they'd baptize people, and they'd write it down is great. And whenever I take my, my relatives out to these places, they all want to know if one of their ancestors was there, right? Do you have this surname or do you have that surname? Um, and so we do a lot of that work as well with the family connections. And then I want to look at material culture. So what are the things that we can and cannot see archaeologically in terms of the material culture? So, you know, I may not be able to find dancing, but I could find a big hall that might be uh, good for dancing. I can't necessarily find the beaded objects, although sometimes I can, um, but you can find the beads that were being used to make Métis garments. You can find evidence of uh, buffalo hunting. This is uh, Gabriel Dumont with his horse and his rifle, and we find pieces of all these sorts of things at archeological sites. So in order to do this, I've been looking at a type, type of site connected to buffalo hunting brigades, which were large groups of mostly Métis folks heading out onto the prairies. Uh, in the summer, they used to go out, uh, there's an account of 1614, I believe is Alexander Ross's count, of people leaving Pemina. And that would have been uh, in the 1840, 1840, I think. So large groups of these Métis, related Métis families going out and hunting bison. As bison uh, populations declined toward the end um, of the sort of 1850s and 60s, you start to see them moving further west. These large groups go out and build cabin sites on the prairie to spend the winter so they can hunt bison in the winter as part of their economy. <coughs> these are known as overwintering or hivernal sites. And they build these small cabins with thatched roofs and mudded walls and live together uh, during the winter time. <coughs> 
These are all throughout uh, the prairie or would have been. We do know a few archaeologically, so these are ones that have been documented archaeologically and I have now worked at two of them, at Chimney Coulee, which is in the Cypress Hills in southern Saskatchewan, and then Buffalo Lake, which is between Edmonton and Calgary in Alberta. These were really rich sites in terms of people. This is Sir Sam Steele, for Canadian historians in the, in the audience. Um, and he went through the Buffalo Lake uh, wintering site in 1875. And he uh, searched amongst what he called 400 cabins. And if this is even close to being right, and you estimate four people per cabin, which if anyone knows Métis families, they're not that small. My great-great-grandfather had 19 children. 19, yeah. Um, but even still, that's like 1,600 people. Or, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge clustering of people at that time. It would have been the largest settlement between Red River and Victoria at the time. So these are really important places, um, and they have a lot of, you know, we have these histories of them, but they also have this material record. Um, I forgot to check the sound. I sometimes play Lord McDonald's reel, which I found. Um, but jigging, of course, important part of Métis way of life, too. So these give us an insight into Métis life ways. What were people doing? What's left behind in those? So as opposed to looking for European and First Nations goods, I'm looking at what were Métis ways of life? What does this tell us about that? And it's a very different question. So one of the things we look at is the economy of, bu of bison hunting. So this is just a graph of uh, materials that we collected in an excavation in 2014 at Buffalo Lake outside of a cabin. So there had been some work done inside and I was curious about what the pattern looks like outside. And what you see is a preponderance of, of fauna, so animal bone, primarily bison, um, much of which had been processed, chopped up, boiled for marrow. If you take that out, the next most common is actually lithic material, so stone tools. And that was very much within the Métis context. So there is some evidence of, of using different types of technologies, certainly. Uh, and there are, for example, hide tanning, which would have been going on with uh, the bison, um, uh, like making bison leather, is actually better, e more easily done using certain types of stone tools as opposed to metal, right? So there's, a, there's definitely a reflection there. Sometimes we get really lucky. Um, last summer, yeah, not this past summer, but the summer before, my graduate student was doing an excavation at a cabin site in the Cypress Hills. He calls me up on the phone and he goes, I think I need you to come down. And he sent me this picture. There's a whole bunch of beads all together. So I had to look at it and I was like, I'll be there by midnight. This was like an eight hour drive from Edmonton. So I like went to the museum and got a whole bunch. Anyway. What he found was a bead work pattern in the ground. And for those who've done archaeological excavations, this find is exceptionally rare. And it's amazing that we didn't destroy it, because these are not attached to anything anymore. They would have been once, but they're not anymore. They're just sitting in the earth. And he was going carefully enough that he started to see the pattern, and then he slowed right down. And so we were able to cut it out and conserve it and take it back. Um, and it is probably the closest thing that I could imagine to a smoking gun of a Métis cabin because this is a pattern that you see very similar versions of on Métis beadwork from the same time period. So sometimes you get to be so close to the ancestors. And he's done some historical work that we think we know which families were here. So we're down to probably five or six families who made this beadwork, which is an amazing story to be able to tell, right? To connect it to, to that living history. Beads are everywhere in Métis sites. Perhaps unsurprisingly, we are known as the beadwork people. At Buffalo Lake, for example, over the course of the history of excavations there, this is the count of all the different materials found. That's 12,000 beads, tiny beads that you find. So a very important part of our, our way of life, right? And if you take out the beads, then you mostly have the, that animal bone and then other, other pieces of our day-to-day uh, -day life. After having worked on Métis sites for a few years. I was talking with some of my, my relatives, some elders, um, and some other scholars that I've been working with, and I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be in relation with the past. So in Cree, there's a term, wakotuin. Wakotuin is, as my colleague Matt Wildcat describes, it is a concept, usually translated as like all my relations or, or being in that relation, good relations. It is a practice. And it is a law. 
I've been thinking a lot about what it means for me to conceptualize the artifacts that I work with as my relations. Because that changes the nature, right? And maybe it's the fact that I am in relation to them that maybe I need to be the caretakers. Maybe I, you know, what does it mean if I didn't send that beadwork to a museum where it's sat behind glass? Is there a way I can differently imagine what that would mean for my people, right, and for my community? It also changes the way I actually practice in the field, how I do field work, how I come to that uh, excavation every single day, right, and, how I, and, and the kind of ceremony that I might do. So this framework is a very different one that I'm going to try to find mixed, you know, European and First Nations and say that's Métis. This is taking a concept which is drawn from my Cree ancestors uh, and talked about by my Métis relatives and, and thinking about what that means for my own practice as an archaeologist. Now, this would not be an appropriate approach for everyone and it might not be an appropriate approach for someone who's not Métis or not Cree, right? But there are ways in which we can understand these different elements of relating to the past, of telling the stories of the past, that we need to make better space for. And that we need to, like for me, this is a very decolonized way to do archaeology, right? And it's not where I want it to be yet, but I'm on a path that I hope will take me to a place where, you know, the structures themselves can be questioned of how we do what we do, how we put things in boxes and put them in museums, where they don't get to be part of our living, you know, contemporary lives. And we see this in talk, talk about repatriation, right? We, you know, sometimes these things need to go back to the earth. Sometimes they just need to come back into the community as well. Because they are our relatives and they matter. It's not just the ancestors. These are our ancestors too. So how, so how do we go, how do we, how do we do this more broadly, right? This is my specific case. But this speaks to a whole bunch of different things that I'd like to see happen in archaeology. One, we've got to be better at telling our history and not making it in the past, but still in the present. Who are we as archaeologists? Why do we do what we do? We need to ask those questions. What gives us the right to study what we're studying? In some cases, it's more clear-cut. In indigenous contexts, likely less clear-cut. We need to think about stewardship. And I know both the SAA and the CAA are revisiting their ethical guidelines right now. And stewardship is one of the big things that's being discussed. Is it appropriate for archaeologists to be framed as the stewards or of one of, you know, several uh, stewards? And there could be some shared care, but it may not, it shouldn't necessarily be our job, archaeologist's job, to care only. We need to acknowledge our, our, how we're implicated in settler colonialism and how those systems are ongoing and how they also make it often very difficult for indigenous people to enter into archaeology because it's such a foreign way of thinking about the past, right? It's so kind of disruptive to, to our kind of way of thinking. And we can do this through teaching. So for those you know, of you who may be in a learning context, this is a really important thing to talk about in the classroom because we are, I was talking actually earlier with Sean about this, how students come into our classroom and they're disciplined already. And we discipline them by teaching them certain things. What is good archaeology? What is bad archaeology? What to do, what not to do? And that's a powerful place to sit, right? So we need to, we need to think about what that means. And I think, of course, to take this back out even further, this is really important in our moment of thinking about reconciliation. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, which I've sometimes talked about in a talk like this. Because I think archaeology does have a power to help us reconnect, um, those of us who have, might have been taken through colonization. It has the power to raise up stories that are not necessarily told. And there are many indigenous communities who've lost a lot through colonization. And this can be a way to help them reclaim some of that. There, there can be that role, but it has to be done well. We need to recognize indigenous peoples are the rightful stewards of their own pasts. Sometimes they don't have the capacity to be stewards in the way we want them to, but we have to be careful about that as well. Because if we're imposing, well, we'll give you back the stuff if you have a place to put it. It's like, again, you're assuming that it needs to be conserved in a particular way that might not make sense for that community. We need to recognize indigenous ways of knowing and are telling our own histories, our own frameworks, right? So that idea that or the story of how we got to a place as indigenous people may not match up with the archaeological one, but you shouldn't use that to disprove ours. There are two ways of telling the past, right? Working collaboratively, I think, is, is definitely a way forward. Um, I've been thinking a lot about a consent model. Um, so we talk about consultation, but what does it mean to have ongoing consent for the work that you're doing? 
right? We don't tend to give Indigenous communities the right to say no all the time. Ensuring that communication is ongoing, um, and then again, that decentering of scientific method, it can be very useful and is very important, but it is one of many ways of knowing. And we see this particularly picking up in the area of ancient genetics and genomics. Right? I was just having a conversation with an Indigenous colleague who works in this area, and she was asking me about communities' approach to bioarchaeology and, and what matters to them. Um, and a lot of communities, if ancestors are found by accident or by circ circumstance, they are asking for genetic testing because they want to use that to prove that kind of long history in that area. And I don't want to undermine the right for communities to do that. That's great. But it's still a Western way of proving it. Right? The decision is still in that science model. So we need to think about that more deeply. We need to think about what it means to define good and bad archaeology. We think we know what bad archaeology is, but maybe sometimes what we think is good is not yet good enough. Because right? we have to be able to say, maybe sometimes archaeology should not be done here. Maybe this is not the right approach. Even if I'm super interested in it, maybe that's not the right thing to do. This photo is one, one of my favorite moments. I was out um, doing some work in Saskatchewan <coughs> and we did an opening prayer. And we had a Cree elder and we had a Catholic priest. And this to me was really representing paying respect to my ancestors because many of them were Catholic, right? Many of them practiced in that way. And so the, the smudge and the holy water were there. And then I was in relation with my ancestors as we worked on that space. So I think there's a lot of good ways to move forward here. And I hope, you know, what, what this conversation kind of sparked for you is thinking about who defines what good archaeology is, where the power lies, and the work that we still have to do to make sure that we're doing archaeology in a good way for the future. Hi, hi.